Welcome back, everybody, to Mundane Desperados Premier League Podcast, Episode 6. In seven. This, dang it. Episode 7. <laughs> <laughs> in this week's podcast, we are going to go over the results of Week 16, and then we're going to start talking about the World Cup. Yay! So we're just going to dive right into it, because we're going to try to get through Week 16 as quickly as we can. We're only going to talk about the big six games this weekend, and we'll go over some of the other games just because they happened, and someone may be interested in them. But we're going to start on Saturday, which still had eight games. Still a lot of games to watch. Mm -hmm. But the first game, we're going to kick off City and Brentford, which we were talking about Liverpool and how them losing games were shocking. Liverpool losing to Leeds, Liverpool losing to Nottingham Forest, City losing to Brentford. Probably the three most surprising results so far this season. Yep. So in this game, I mean, Brentford just started off on the front foot. Watching the highlights back, because again, this game was at 4.30 in the morning. Ederson having to make multiple big saves at the start of the game. Both one-on-one shots, saving uh, shots against Tony and... On Yeka, Brentford making Ederson work for his paycheck this week. City had a great attempt with De Bruyne playing it in and Halan crossing it back across an open goal face. Uh, if Gundogan happened to be 8 feet tall, the ball may have gone in, but Gundogan being not 8 feet tall went over yeah. his head. But still a great go- goal-scoring chance for City. Brentford's first goal came from a set-piece. Set-piece happened to be at midfield. Wasn't expecting a goal to come from this set piece, but uh, Tony heads it home in the 16th minute to give Brentford a one nothing lead. Very shortly after, City almost got a penalty kick. It was a very close handball call on the penalty box line. It ended up being just a free kick just outside the box, but that led to much chaos, much shouting, much pushing and shoving, a lot of... <laughs> Lots of hand wavings. Lots lots of hand wavings. <laughs> this seemed to wake City up, and they really dominated and controlled the rest of the first half, which led to a goal from Foden scoring off of a corner kick, where he just rocketed a half volley to level the game one-to-one right before halftime. After halftime, City came out, did more of the same, dominating the majority of the second half, but just credit to Brent- Brentford for holding their own. Like, they were under siege from City, but didn't let a second one in. To to reward Brentford's defensive effort, a charging run down the side made by Vissa, and then a tap-in from Tony, who made a just sprinting down the center of the field to score in the 98th minute to give Brentford the 2-1 win. Watching the highlights back, it was a super entertaining game. It was very back and forth. Goalkeepers had to make a bunch of really spectacular saves to even keep the game 2-1 to one for Brentford. It could have easily been like 5-3 to three or 4-2. to two. But, hey, Brentford wins. Yeah. Very shocking. Did not see that one coming. I don't think anyone saw that one coming. In the stats, just from talking about how it seemed like Manchester City was dominating that game, they had 75% possession. 29 total shots. But Brentford had more shots on target with 8 to City 6. But then they Manchester City had two times as many touches and three times as many passes. So Manchester City did really dominate that game, but Brentford's defense stuck it out. They threw themselves at the ball, they threw themselves in front of players, and they were rewarded in the 98th minute getting a 2-1 win against Manchester City. But hey, Ederson got a nice warm-up for the World Cup. <laughs> yes, he did. Ederson had five official saves, because one of the shots on goal was saved by Laporte on the goal line. Mm. So that's one of the ones where Brentford could have won 3-1, to one, or they could have lost 6-2. to two. Either yeah. one. But they won, and keeping City in second, dropping more points to Arsenal, which we'll get to. But now they are on 32 points, only two points ahead of Newcastle, which we will also get to. Yeah. 
in this game, maybe unsurprisingly, Christiane and I had picked Manchester City to win. So we start this weekend off to a great start at 0-1. <laughs> whoop, whoop! <laughs> Next game of the weekend, we're just going to gloss over it. Bournemouth and yeah. Everton. I actually don't even know what the, the score for that was. Bournemouth won 3 to nothing. Oh. We both had guessed a tie. So if some is good, more and better, we start the weekend 0-2. <laughs> womp womp. Which leads us to our next game of the Big Six, which is mm-hmm. Liverpool and Southampton. Yeah. Uh, game ended 3-1. to one. Firmino showed right away why he should have gotten a call-up for the World Cup. with a very early goal at six minutes. But then Southampton responds right away with their own goal by Che Adams in the ninth minute. So, you know, right away, 1-1, big game. But then two more goals from Liverpool by Nunez on the 21st minute and then 42nd minute. And then nothing else happens. The Liverpool had 60% possession and seven shots on target, which is only two more than Southampton's five. So, you know, still a lot of shots, but just a 3-1 to one score. And with this, Liverpool moves up to sixth place and will stay that way until uh, after the World Cup. Yeah, it's still shocking how poorly Liverpool started this season. Mm -hmm. And especially you look at, as I said earlier, lost to Nottingham Forest, lost to Leeds. They're still in sixth place. I mean, they're four points behind Manchester United in fifth, and they're a point ahead of Brighton and Chelsea. Yeah. But... Sixth place is sixth place. Yeah, it just uh, their their streak doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. Like, not. it's just there's no consistency. And in proof of that, Christiane, you had predicted a tie. Mm-hmm. I predicted Liverpool winning. <laughs> so I moved to one and two on the weekend. Christiane continues. I went three. Oh, and three. Listen, I'm consistent this week. <laughs> Unlike Liverpool. It will be surprising to see how much focus uh, Darwin Nunez gets moving forward. Mm -hmm. It does seem like he is the one person on that team, as of right now, who can consistently score. Yeah. He hasn't gotten a ton of consistent playing time. These past three games are his most consistent stretch of playing time, playing 90 minutes, 86 minutes, and 86 minutes. And from that, the past three games, he has two goals and an assist. So yeah. we'll see how, yeah, how that shakes up after the World Cup. There's yeah. Liverpool still seemingly desperately missing Mane, the other half of the Salah Mane just powerhouse. As we said, sixth place is sixth place, so they can't yeah. be upset going into the international break with how their season started. Yeah. And then the next game was Forest versus Crystal Palace. So which... in this game, again, skip. Yeah, skip. 1-0, no- Forest, Nottingham Forest. Yep, Nottingham Forest wins one to nothing. We both guessed Crystal Palace. I mean, as you do at the time, Nottingham Forest <laughs> was still in dead last. last. Now, with that win... They move up to still in the relegation zone, so... (laughs) Not as bad. (laughs) Not as bad. They went from 20th to 18th. Mm -hmm. But that moves myself on the weekend to 1-3, and and Christiane 0-4. 0-4. Consistency is key this week, and I'm consistently guessing these games wrong. (laughs) But Christiane, your luck will change, because we move into Spurs and Leeds, and we both Mm -hmm. guess Spurs in... Again, if the Brentford City game was exciting, the Spurs-Leeds game, equally, if not more exciting. Yeah. Leeds finds themselves in back-to-back four to three games. (laughs) Granted, the last week, they beat Bournemouth. This week, they lost to Spurs, but four to three nonetheless. It was actually, from the highlights that I watched and part of the game that we watched, a very even and -and back-and-forth game. Mm -hmm. Leeds took the advantage in the 10th minute by a goal from Somerville. 
which, fun fact, that gives Somerville a goal in each of his past four games, with, I think, two game winners? Nice. Kane responded in the 25th minute, scoring off a corner kick. It was initially saved by... I learned how to pronounce his name, and I'm probably still going to mispronounce it. I believe it's Melier, the Leeds goalkeeper. So, right. you know, the S, the E, and the R, all silent. <laughs> <laughs> but the initial save by Melier, put back by Kane, levels the game 1-1 to in the 25th minute. A bit of controversy on this goal. Melier as I said, gets the save, but was run into and knocked over, sending him sprawling to the back of the net. So open goal through the traffic for Harry Kane, just an easy tap in home. Harry Kane mm -hmm. scores those goals 10 out of 10 times, but a little controversy surrounding that goal. Rodrigo responds, scoring a stunner right before halftime. It was a poor defensive clearance by the Spurs and headed back in to the attacking third by Leeds, and Rodrigo just with a beautiful volley near the penalty spot. So that brings us into halftime, with Leeds winning 2-1. to one. Tottenham comes back out of halftime, and pretty much immediately levels back 2-2 two to two on a Ben Davies goal on the 51st minute. It was, so, it was unlucky for Leeds, as Melier and Christensen seemed to get in each other's way. Melier should have saved it, ball sort of spins out from under him, and Christensen gets blocked by Melier trying to save it, and the ball just sort of spins away from both of them, giving the Spurs the equalizer 2-2. Two to two. Rodrigo then scores again in the 76th <laughs> minute to put Leeds back up 3-2, to two, scoring his fifth goal in four games. That guy is on a tear. Yeah. But then... Ben Tanker, I think for the second consecutive week, levels the game in the 81st minute, sort of on an unlucky deflection by a Leeds defender. It still may have gone in, but the deflection didn't really help Melier trying to protect his goal. And then two minutes later, Ben Cantor scores again, putting the game away 4-3 to three for Spurs. It was, as I said, a pretty back-and-forth game. And then to cap off... Tyler Adams gets a red card on yellow card accumulation. <laughs> Just, you know, cherry on top for Leeds. Womp womp. I do think they were very unlucky not to get a point from this game. They really fought Tottenham as best as they could. Just Tottenham a little bit too much. A little mm -hmm. bit too aggressive, especially coming out of the second half, scoring three goals. And Leeds not really being able to maintain possession or control the pace of the second half. So Tottenham wins 4-3. to three. And as I said, both Christiane and I guessed Tottenham to win. So that puts me at 2-3 and three, and Christiane at 1-4. and four. My first right guess. Christiane on the board. Yeah, it and was bound to happen. To keep that going, the next game that we are going to gloss over very quickly was West Ham and Leicester. Leicester winning 2 to nothing. This gives Leicester their second consecutive win, which Christiane guessed, putting her at 2-4, and four, and myself at 2-4, and because I guessed a tie. Oh, snap. So after all that, <laughs> we both tied. ended 2-4. <laughs> uh, our next game was Newcastle versus Chelsea, which, oh, man. Chelsea, what... What are you doing to me? Listen, Legend. very begrudgingly, we both guessed Newcastle would win this game. And, I mean, it turns out we were right. Cause... Yeah, because Chelsea's just not trying. Like, they, they had some shots. I feel like there's no want there. There's, like, again, not the massacre we thought or I thought it was going to be because Newcastle has just been... There was, they're not. They're the team who's been scoring consistently like three or four goals a game, right? Their past five games, they've scored one goal Two goals, four goals, four goals, and now one goal. Yeah, so it could have gone way worse for us. But, I mean, Chelsea also didn't have a very good luck in this game. Loftus-Cheek gets subbed out early on in the first half, which brought T. Silva on. And then Cesar got subbed out during the half due to possible injury. I think he hurt his ankle or his calf. So again, Chelsea just doesn't have their starting lineup. Shouldn't be an issue, though, because it's Chelsea. 
every player should be good. Every player should be going out there. There are quite a few yellows, mostly on the Newcastle side. But unluckily, or luckily if you're a Newcastle fan, Joe Wilcox scores in the 67th minute with an assist by Almiron. So with this result, Newcastle stays in third place until after the World Cup, which, you know, good for them. This win, Newcastle now on a 10-game unbeaten streak. The last time they lost was all the way back to New- er, to Liverpool. But now with the month break for the World Cup, hopefully it will give Potter about a month to adjust the team, come up with something, anything. And then by then we'll also have a few players back. Please, Reese James, come back. We need you desperately. <laughs> so... The break could not have come at a better time. Chelsea needs to reset. They need to readjust things. I don't know what's happening. The players need to wake up. Looking at the stats, not two shots on target and five shots total are not going to win you very many games, especially, as you said, with how well Newcastle's been playing this season. I said the last time they lost, they've only lost once, and it was at the end of August to Liverpool. They are 8-6-1. Mm -hmm. So they have officially now lost less games than Manchester City has. Mm -hmm. That loss, Chelsea all the way down in eighth on 21 points, losing to Brighton and Hove on goal differential. Yeah. And two points ahead of Fulham and Brentford. So not a place where you expect to see Chelsea now almost halfway through the season. Yeah. But with that win, as we said, Newcastle stays in third two points behind Mm -hmm. Manchester City and a point ahead of Tottenham. With Newcastle's win, as both Christiane and I selected Newcastle to win, (laughs) that puts us both at three and four. Which leads us into another Sean and Christiane correct prediction as Arsenal beats Wolverhampton two to nothing. (laughs) Not much to report out of this game. Both teams had their chances, but... Going into halftime, the score is 0-0. Odegaard opens the scoring, slotting home across from Vieira to give Arsenal a 1-0 lead in the 54th minute. And then the second goal was a bit weird. It was a bit of penalty box pinball. It started by a poor clear by Wolves. Zinchenko collects the ball, crosses it in. The first shot from Martinelli was saved, and then Odegaard puts another one away to give Arsenal the 2 Nothing advantage and two nothing win. Again, not much else to report from this game. Wolverhampton didn't put up much of a fight. Possession was sixty two percent for Arsenal. Shots on target was four to two for Arsenal. Shots fourteen to eleven for Arsenal. So like I said, Wolverhampton had a couple couple chances that they just couldn't put away, but not much of a game to report back on. Mm-hmm. But with that win, Arsenal obviously stays in first, growing their lead to City, who just lost by five points. And with Arsenal's win, that puts Christiane and I both now at four and four. To end you know how Saturday. I like, you know how I like my evenness. Four and four to end this Saturday is not a bad place to be. No, it's that not. leads us into the two games on Sunday. First game was Brighton and Villa. This is one of the games we're going to pass over. Both of us had picked Brighton to win. Villa won 2-1, so that puts both of us at 4-5. And And then the next game, we have Fulham versus Manchester United. Uh, I was very close to being right here, because I said a tie? No, I said Fulham was going to win. You said Fulham was going to win. Sean said Manchester United was going to win. I said Manchester United was going to win. And the game ended 2-1, but honestly, that game could have gone either way my uh, baby takes the <laughs> morning train uh manchester united gets an earliest goal with erickson scoring at the 14th minute i mean you gotta always love watching erickson score uh and it stayed that way until dan james scored for fulham at the 61st uh but man did fulham try their best they had 14 shots and nine on target uh and an almost even possession and then with Fulham having 53% possession. However, sadly... Uh, uh, interjecting uh, a little bit, a, uh-huh. a bit of a revenge game for Dan James coming from 
Manchester United for a few seasons. Oh. And transferred to Leeds and is currently loaned out to Fulham from Leeds. So a revenge goal for Dan James. But then at the 93rd minute, 18-year-old Alejandro Garancho scores to make it 2-1. to one. And with that, Manchester United stays in fifth place and Fulham in ninth. But it was a, it was an interesting game. It was a fun back and forth game. Fulham really tried their hardest. I actually don't remember seeing Cristiano Ronaldo in that game, but I'm assuming he was on the bench. He was not suited up to play this game. He was not even uh, a substitute. Well, not shocked. Not shocked. I don't, I don't see him lasting in Man United I past think, the transfer market. I think he, if a team is interested in him, he gets shipped out of there as soon as the transfer window opens. He has burned that Manchester United bridge back and, down to the ground. I know he has the appeal, like the name appeal, selling shirts appeal, but I can't see any team wanting him right now. After everything he's done, and not I even think a play. team still takes him. I think, I mean, he's oh, yeah, still no a good doubt. player. He can still score goals. And as you said, he has the popularity of whatever 500 million social media yeah. followers that he has. Transfer window, I think, opens back up in January. So. Mm -hmm. have a little bit of time. Most of that will be dedicated to the World Cup. But mm -hmm. yeah, we'll see. Yeah. In that game, uh, as Christian was saying, a pretty even game. Fulham actually leading possession, even on shots, and Manchester United had two more shots on target than Fulham. So a very even game. As mentioned, a little disappointing for Fulham not to walk away with the point, but yeah. well earned to Manchester United for sticking with it and getting all three points really in the dying moments at the 93rd minute. But with that, that ends the weekend. Ends weekend or week 16 with Manchester United winning 2 to 1, which puts me at 5 and 5 and Christian at 4 and 6. Still speeding right along through the top 10. Arsenal still in first at 37 points. Manchester City in second at 32 points. Newcastle in third with 30 points. Tottenham in fourth with 29 points. Manchester United in fifth with 26 points. Liverpool in sixth with 22 points. Brighton and Chelsea tied at seven and eighth on 21 points. And then Fulham, Brentford, and Crystal Palace tied at 9th, 10th, and 11th on 19 points. Christiane. Yes. That leads us into the World Cup. <gasps> yes. I've been waiting four and a half years for this. <laughs> so for this, there's a lot to go over. And neither of us are fast enough editors to be able to go uh, game day by game day. So what we're going to do in this, our World Cup kickoff, is go through the groups, our predictions for the groups, some of the big games, I know Christiane's going to want to talk about a couple of the Brazil games, and then we'll go through the teams and some of, some of the major injuries that may or may not affect how this World Cup goes. So I guess we just start at the top. Group A, Qatar, Ecuador, Ecuador? <laughs> Wait, hold on. Ecuador, Senegal, and the Netherlands. <sighs> well, I hope Qatar gets last place. And I feel bad for their team, but I just want them to lose. Like, not even win a game. But I think Netherlands, Senegal, Ecuador, Qatar, in that order. I will mirror that. I think the Netherlands don't have an issue getting three wins out of this group. Mm -hmm. I think Senegal and Ecuador may play each other pretty well. I, yeah, yeah. I don't see Qatar winning a game out of this group. Even with the home advantage, I don't, I don't see it. Like Although, Qatar is not really known for soccer, so I don't. Yes, see correct. It. Although in the Senegal team, Pape Cisse is hopefully going to recover before the World Cup. Yeah, that's true. With a hip injury, Buenos Sar has had knee surgery on September third, going to miss seemingly the World Cup completely. No. Oh. And then the biggest news, Sadio Mane, who was always going to be included in the Senegal group, whether he had could play or not, on November 8th, limped off 
in his final game playing for Bayern Munich. So they had x-rays. I haven't seen any updates of that, but that uh-huh. could really affect how Senegal plays because he is the person who makes that team go. Yeah. So if they don't have Sadio Mane, that may affect the Just ranking. Just the mentality. Be- yeah, and who advances second out of that group between Ecuador and Senegal. But as it stands... I think Netherlands, Senegal, Ecuador, and Qatar. Group Group B. One of the tougher groups, I would say. Yeah, this is going to be a tough one. There are two really tough groups in this World Cup. I think Group B is one of them. I think Group E may be the other one, but we will get to that group when we get to that Mm -hmm. group. Group B, England, Iran, USA, and Wales. Yeah. England's winning this group. Yeah. Even without having Chilwell or Reese James, I think they still have enough talent on that team to mm-hmm. play very well, especially with Harry Kane up front. He's going to score a bunch of goals. Yeah. I think there's still going to be some questions on injuries. James Madison mm-hmm. taking an injury in his last game for Leicester. It'll be interesting to see if he can get back in time for... The group stage, it seemed like it wasn't in- serious. That's what the team announced. But then with having Calvin Phillips and Kyle Walker still trying to fight their way back to World Cup or match fitness. But I think England, still with those peop- with those players out, I mean, their three goalies could be starters on any World Cup team in Jordan yeah. Pickford, Nick Pope, and Aaron Ramsdale. I think second place will be tough, though. It's going to be a very close race between the U.S. and Wales. So I think the Wel- the Welsh team has enough fuel. That- I think Wales coming in off of the playoff, a very emotional playoff against Ukraine, yeah. may carry them over into the World Cup. I'm mm-hmm. hoping that when the spotlights turn on, the USA will show up, but they have not had a very good showing as a no. run-up to this World Cup, which I am yeah. very concerned about. I, they've had a very poor showing, which is why I'm leaning towards Wales. But again, it's going to be a toss-up between USA and Wales. So being a homer, I'm going to go England, USA, Wales, Iran. Knowing that, to, again, USA may flip-flop with Wales. That's going to yeah. be, if they can get a point out of that Wales game and have it come down to goal differential, that I think a U, the USA has a chance. Because mm-hmm. both of them are losing to England, and both yeah. of them are probably going to beat Iran. Yeah. So it's just going to come down to that head-to-head game, and mm-hmm. if anyone can get a point or a victory out of it. Yeah, agreed. But just to change it up, so we're not saying the same thing every time, I will say England, Wales, U.S., Iran. Fair enough. Yeah. Group C, we have Argentina, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, Poland. I mean, Argentina, obviously, going to be number one in that group. Argentina Uh, in Messi's last dance. mm -hmm. I think they're going to come with some extra juice. Sure. (laughs) I'll I'll say yes, but I don't think it will be enough to carry them to win it all, but I think it will carry them to make it to quarter or semifinals. And then I will say Mexico also comes out of that group in second place. Argentina, fun fact, third highest odds of winning this World Cup at 650, Mm -hmm. plus 650. England, plus plus 700. And we'll get to the two teams that are first and second in that conversation. Yes, I think Argentina gets first out of this group. Between... Messi, I think uh, Paulo Dybala is going to shoulder a lot of that load, being one of the younger players in that group and a very good player for Roma. I think he's going to have a great World Cup and hopefully be very influential in how they play. But Messi, Angel De Maria, they're, I'm assuming, starting goalkeeper. It's a toss-up between Franco Armani and Emilio Martinez who is starting this World Cup, but both of them are in their 30s. Mm -hmm. Uh, Otamende, who is one of Argentina's 
most featured defenders. He has 92 caps in total for Argentina. I think it's going to be an interesting last ride for a lot of these Argentina players who we've seen in a number of World Cups mm-hmm. till now. So it's crazy to think that this is going to be the World Cup, the last World Cup for a lot of players, yeah, like I mean, a lot even, of big name players. Messi and Ronaldo, like yeah, you need to enjoy it while it lasts. We've had a very good run, a lot mm-hmm. of good decades with these players, but you can't play forever. Yeah. This is I also mean, Neymar's even, last World Cup. <laughs> yeah, maybe Neymar. And even you look at Poland, who's also in this group. Lewandowski's 34. So. Mm-hmm. See, I feel like Mexico and Poland will fight hard for that second place, but I think Mexico might come out of this. Uh, I was going to go Poland. I was going to go Argentina, Poland, Mexico, Saudi Arabia. Because I think as much as the USA had struggling to find form before this World Cup. I don't know if Mexico's been much better, both playing out of the CONCACAF qualifying region. I know Mm -hmm. Poland qualified out of their group, which surprised a lot of people, which may give them a bit of confidence coming into these group stages. Yeah. But, yeah, we'll see. Also, big shout out to Ochoa for (laughs) making it to another World Cup. Yeah, talk about last rides. Yeah. This is his fifth World Cup. Ochoa, 37. One of yeah. the most elder statesmen in these World Cups. We'll have to see some of the fitness of the Mexican team. Um, Raul Jimenez was an interesting choice for Mexico. He may be out. They're trying to rush him to get back, but uh, Jesus Corona also out for Mexico and a player that they will miss. Yeah. So that is Group C. Group D has the second odds-on favorite to win the World Cup in France, Mm -hmm. sitting at plus 600, and maybe, for them at least, one of the easier groups of France, Australia, Denmark, and Tunisia. France, number one in that group. I want to say Denmark comes out of this. I think Denmark does. I think... Yeah. Just the, if nothing else, the camaraderie coming out of the last Euro tournament and what happened to that team and the challenges that they faced. Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing can be harder than that. I think coming out of this group, it's going to be France, Denmark, Australia, and Tunisia. Mm -hmm. I agree. And then we go to Group E, which, as Sean said earlier, is the second toughest group. I think, yes, this is going to be a tough group. Yeah, we have Spain, Costa Rica, Germany, and Japan. I want to say Germany, Spain, Japan, Costa Rica. It's Spain and Germany are going to fight for that number one spot. Like Mm -hmm. Both teams are doing great right now. I Um, think it's going to be interesting because it's sort of the competition between a younger squad and an aging squad. Yeah. Spain's total team age average, I think, is like 25 or 26, when Germany is sort of on the opposite side of that, where their team age average is hovering somewhere around the 30s. Mm -hmm. I mean, Manuel Neuer is 36, Kevin Trapp, 32. Uh, they They do have a lot of young stars that are coming out to their... Uh, to this World Cup, like David Rahm from Leipzig being 24. A lot of d- young Dortmund players who are going to be really good. But then you Kai have, Havertz. Like, Kai Havertz, yep. Uh, the Chelsea forward. But then you have like Thomas Mueller, the elder statesman of Germany at this point in time, 33. You have Mario Götze, who's 30. Yeah. I'm Gundogan, surprised he's still playing, honestly. I'd forgotten yeah. about him. Sorry. I think I think two players that Germany are going to miss that they have officially been ruled out is Timo and Florian Wurtz. Yeah. Which is tough to see. And Marco Ruiz is also yeah. out of this World Cup. Because Timo always does really well when he's playing for Germany. So I yes. think it's going to be a big loss for them. And Marco Ruiz, really one of their core midfielders 
that plays consistently well for that team. So they're going to miss him as well. Mm -hmm. But I agree. It's I mean, it's going to be a coin toss between Spain and Germany. I think Spain's exper or Germany's experience, at least in the group stage, gives them the eight gives them the advantage over Spain. But didn't the last World Cup, wasn't it like the first time they had never gotten out of a group stage? Oh, yeah. Germany came last in their group to Sweden, yeah. Mexico, and South Korea. It's just always I mean, hard to see, in my mind, even if Germany's not playing well, to say to myself that Germany's not playing well. They're just always that <laughs> team that they're like, oh, yeah, Germany, they're going to do well. Yeah. But I think out of this group, I think Japan may steal some points to maybe mm -hmm. get out of this group. Um, but I think it's sort of 1A and 1B with Spain and Germany. Yeah. It sucks because I love the Japanese team and I love their fans. So it would be, I'll be upset if they leave early, but they're just very unlucky to be put on the, in this group where you have Spain and Germany. Who it is have a just... tough group. They're just a powerhouse team. A little less tough. Segway to Group yeah. F. Belgium, Canada, Morocco, and Croatia. Belgium's It'll... coming out of this on top, and then Croatia. I think Belgium definitely wins their group. It'll be interesting to see if making it to the finals last World Cup gives Croatia any type of advantage. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're still playing with some of the stars that were in last World Cup. You always have Luka Modric playing out of the midfield. Another mm -hmm. player who is undoubtedly in his last World Cup at 37. You have Ivan Perisic playing out of the midfield. You have some really good uh, young players like Luka Sucic from Salzburg. I mean, so they're... It'll be interesting to see how they play. It's yeah. I don't think they beat Belgium to take the crown the of this spot. group. Yeah. But I think it's going to be I think second place out of this group isn't the worst thing in the world. Mhm. Mm It'll be interesting to see how well Canada plays. Do you think this is Belgium's year to win it all? Because they've been a powerhouse team for so long at this point that it's always a little heartbreaking seeing them get kicked out. But in the last World Cup, they kicked Brazil out, so yeah. I wasn't that upset to see them not win. Um, but I would, if Belgium wins, if Brazil doesn't win, I would like Belgium to win. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm not sure. Just with how many good teams there are this year. I think Belgium still has the talent to be able mm -hmm. to make the semifinals or the finals, but eventually they will have to be tested by teams like Germany or Spain or Brazil or France. And yes, Canada, the winners of the CONCACAF, and this is Canada's second World Cup appearance. Their last appearance was in 1986. Wow. So they are probably coming in with a lot of energy Mm -hmm. Very excited to play in this World Cup. I don't know if I'm that means that they can beat yeah. Belgium or Croatia, but they're they're definitely going to bring it. They're going to give it yeah. their best effort. Yeah, those teams can't sleep on Canada. Because Canada, also a handful of world-class players with a really good young talent, Alfonso Davies, who plays for Bayern Munich. So it'll be interesting to see how he makes that team go as... He will probably be the leader of that club. Mm -hmm. So, some North America home cooking, but they're in a tough group to advance yeah. out of the group stage. Yeah, agreed. Which and then group? the next group. Go for it, Christiane. My group, we got Brazil, Serbia, Switzerland, Cameroon. Brazil's coming out on top. I don't think there's a question of the favorites. The current odds-on favorites to win this World Cup, yeah, not making which it always, out of this group. Always makes me nervous when people say, "Oh, Brazil's the favorite." Yeah, don't tell me that because then I get excited <laughs> and I get my hopes up, and I'm, 
I've already told myself Brazil's probably not going to win it. I want them to win it so desperately. I want to be old enough to be able to enjoy Brazil winning a World Cup. Last time they won, I was 12 years old. I couldn't drink. I put in a bet, which I won, but they told me I was too young to win the money. <laughs> so I want in my adult hood to see brazil win a world cup if this is the year i will take it i just i just want that i want to see that um we have a good team we have three amazing goalies we have t silva who is an amazing captain even if they don't give him the captain band he will lead this team to victory we have danny alves who does not put up with anyone's crap Probably will be. He's too old too. Yeah, he will probably <laughs> not start, but if he is out on the field, he will give it his all. We have Neymar, which I've not sure I've said it on this podcast, but I am not a Neymar fan. I don't think he plays like a team member, but he will help us win it. Please, please let Brazil win. <laughs> <laughs> well, regardless. They make it out of the group stage. I don't yes. think with any difficulties. If they don't yeah. advance off of full nine points out of this group stage, then maybe you have concern, uh, a valid concern. Mm -hmm. But I don't think Serbia, Switzerland, or Cameroon have the firepower to be able to beat Brazil. Yeah. Man, I... Who's going to come in second place in Group G? <laughs> I'm torn between Serbia and Switzerland. I'm going to go with Serbia. I think I it's going to go top down, Brazil, Serbia, yeah. Switzerland, Cameroon. I was leaning towards Serbia. I just, Cameroon always has a good team, but I don't think they will come out of this. That is true. Cameroon always shows up to the World Cup. They always yeah. play spoilers to at least one team. Mm hmm. Please don't let that be Brazil. Leads us to Group H. Group H. One of the other tougher groups, maybe not the group of death that Group E is. But yeah. Portugal, Ghana, Uruguay, and South Korea. I want to say Portugal and Uruguay come out of this. I first thought Portugal had a really good team, but now there's so much drama going around with that team that I think it's going to distract them. I, I do agree. I think Portugal, on paper, have easily one of the top five teams in this World Cup. But I feel like the drama is going to get in the way. I mean, their starting goalkeepers are Raul Patricio, Jose Sa, and Di Diogo Costa, who are three very good goalkeepers in their own right. They have the ageless wonder, also Pepe, in defense. <laughs> yeah, ageless wonder. They have Ruben Diaz. They have Jaro Cancelo from Manchester City playing side-by-side -side in their defense. They have Nuno Mendes, who's a PSG defender, along with Danilo Pereira, or Pereira. Like, just that defense alone is would start on any other national team. In the midfielder, in the midfield, they have Bruno Fernandes, Bernardo Silva, Mateus Nunez, William Carvalho, Joao Mario, and Ruben Neves, which is a solid midfield. And then in up front, Cristiano Ronaldo, Jaro Felix, and Andre Silva. So they definitely have the talent on that team to make a run. Mm -hmm. It just, yeah, I mean, with everything surrounding Cristiano Ronaldo right now, and maybe a bit blown out of perspective when it comes to World Cup training, since they've really only trained with each other for a few days now. Yeah. But everything coming out of that camp just seems like he's more of a distraction than a help so it'll be interesting when the games start yeah which is crazy because this is distraction didn't need to happen like i understand him doing wanting to do an interview and you know doing whatever he wants but just wait like don't do it right before the world cup mm -hmm. like leave the focus to prepare yourself and your team to play as best you can for this world cup and it's in just... terms of south korea i mean you just always want to see son play well mm -hmm. i know he 
is on the injury watch for South Korea. I think it was the early November game when he needed facial reconstruction surgery. Yeah, he fractured his eye socket, Mm -hmm. which is, ooh. So he should be back in time to make the tournament. There are questions on if he'll play in some of the group stages, but they, if there is a team that needs one person to run, it's Senegal with Mane and South Korea with Son. They are sort of the heart and souls of those teams. So if he's not able to play, then I think it's Portugal, Uruguay, Ghana, South Korea. Mm-hmm. Ghana is another African team that always comes out with everything they've got. Especially and have... when they play the United States. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And what they've it, made three it. Three consecutive World Cups where they were the United States <laughs> not, kryptonite. Not... <laughs> yep. Yeah, and I was going to say they've gotten out of the group stage before, so I wouldn't be surprised yeah, if they the did. Against the United States. <laughs> <laughs> but Uruguay always consistently has a very good team. Portugal, as you said, amazing team on paper. So I just think, again, I there's no good group to be in. There's always going to be, I think, two very strong teams in the in each group. But yeah, it's it's blast the World Cup. You're going up against the best, I guess. Just got to prove yourself. Do you think any African team comes out of any group? But I think we said Senegal does. If Mane plays, I think. Senegal does. That purely comes down to if Sadio Mane plays. Mm-hmm. If Sadio Mane missed, if he has to play every group stage for them, I think to advance out of their group. Gotcha. But I think, I think each team between Senegal, Cameroon, and Ghana, they each have a chance. Yeah. Because in Group G, you beat Switzerland, take a point away from Serbia, you have a chance to get out of that group. And then in Group H, you beat South Korea and take a point away from Uruguay, and you have a chance of getting out of that group. So Mm -hmm. it really comes down to getting that one steal game, getting a point somewhere off of a team that maybe you're not supposed to. Yeah. Or you surprise a team by going all the way, and they are not really expecting that. I don't know. I mean, you seem to see it every year. Croatia last year, I don't... No one had them in the finals. They were not no. supposed to be there, but yeah. played a spectacular World Cup and just didn't. I mean, even in the finals, played France to France's limit. But yeah. Just didn't have the firepower to match France at that time. I remember it being a close game, though. It wasn't like France just like ran all over them. It was a very good match in the end. I think up until the second half, I think it was, because I think it went into halftime two to one. Mm -hmm. The first goal, I believe, was a Croatia own goal, and then Rietzman scored a penalty. But that was Ivan Perichas, I think, scored to make it two to one going into halftime, and then just the firepower of France came out in the second half, scoring two goals. Yeah. It was a very close game. I don't think 4-2 to two really showed how close of a game it was, but I think that also just showed how dominant France was that World Cup. Mm-hmm. But talking about France, I mean, they're going to have to overcome some, probably the most injury-riddled team, maybe outside of England, yeah. coming into the wor- this World Cup. I mean, Paul Pogba's out, N'Golo Kante's out, Kareem Benjamin took a knock in one of their last games, so he's questionable to start in their group stages. Rafael Varane, I think, is out. He got called up to the French squad, so it'll be interesting if they actually expect him to play or if he's... I I haven't heard much about his injury, so Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if they are expecting him to play or not. Yeah, Kim Pepe is also injured. Hernandez is injured. Along with all of these injuries, do you think we'll ever see another Wintertime World Cup? Because it's just, it sucks for all of the club teams, all the club tournaments going on right now. They Now they have to pause everything, pause all the momentum, everything that's been going on. And now all of these players have to play a World Cup. It's the, and now these national teams also don't have time to practice. 
Yeah, they have I mean, what I can't imagine, four or five days. Yeah, I can't imagine we would, but it's sort of double-edged sword because it is focused. That question is focused around the European season, because when you yeah. have a summer World Cup, I mean, it's in the middle of the MLS season, and it's I know the MLS, Brazil season. and the Brazil season and sort of the Western Hemisphere season. Yeah. So I know a lot less players involved in the World Cup that play on those teams. Usually World Cup teams predominantly built by European. European playing players. But it is sort of either or, because, I mean, the United States team has a lot of European players, but also a lot of U.S.-based MLS players, and same mm -hmm. with Canada. Yeah, but I think group or clubs are more used to having things in the summer because you have Copa America, you have Euro Cup, you have Gold Cup, CONCACAF, like all of those also happen in the summertime. Mm -hmm. So these clubs are used to having to work around that already. So I don't, I, yeah, I mean, I get what you're saying. It's like, okay, now we, the European teams can see, feel a little bit of what we're feeling, but it's not as an intense, I don't know. It's just, it's hard because there, there's so many tournaments going on all the time. So there's never really a good time to have a World Cup. It just feels like summertime or at least June, July is a little bit less game and heavy. Mm -hmm. worldwide and like brazil doesn't pause their tournaments they're still i think some of them still go on you just you know you're not going to have certain players yeah yeah and that's the way the mls works as well for some of those tournaments is you just don't get some of the higher profile players for that week yeah for those weeks games so it'll be interesting i don't i think with the scrutiny of this world cup it's definitely going to be a question moving forward. Mm -hmm. Because as we talk about this World Cup, definitely has to be said that... It's very hard to support FIFA and this World Cup knowing everything that happened in Qatar to either get this bid, to get the stadiums ready, get the cities ready, get the hotels ready, all of the human rights thing going on in Qatar, but then also be excited about this World Cup. Mm -hmm. Like... You can be excited, but you can also not support them. But I don't know how to do one or the other because obviously I want to talk to people about this World Cup. I'm excited. We all know I love soccer. I love Brazil. But at the same time, I don't want to support everything that happened leading up to this. Yeah, this this World Cup and everything that leads up to and has happened leading up to this World Cup definitely takes a little bit of the shine off Mm -hmm. what is supposed to be the world's greatest tournament. Yeah. It definitely doesn't feel like a true World Cup because so many so many countries are boycotting having like big uh gatherings for it, yeah. fan festivals because they don't want to be like, oh, we're supporting everything like it's it's very tough. I think Watching this World Cup, you have to keep it in the back of your mind, everything that went on to do it, to make it happen. And I I don't know. It's hard to say, like, don't support the World Cup, but then also watch it. Yeah, I think it's just understanding that as you watch the games, this World mm -hmm. Cup is definitely going to be put under a microscope. I don't know if you saw the pictures coming out of, like, the little pods they have as uh, hotel Oh, yeah, the shipping rooms. containers. Yeah, it's... Sleeping in just gonna be in part by language a shit show <laughs> like it's not gonna end well <laughs> and so, you can't drink in the stadiums like no. what so with how that is being budweiser said, a sponsor <laughs> sorry with that being said there is definitely things to think about outside of yeah. the football being played for this world cup mm -hmm. but i'm still excited for it i'm still gonna yeah watch a lot of the games even with a lot of the games being on at five o'clock in the morning out here on the west coast i will be the crazy one for the both of us and watch all games live you're a psychopath i am a psychopath but i have to do it the world cup kicks off this sunday 8 a.m qatar ecuador and to just run through a couple of the big games, games of interest, since, as we said, next week we'll probably have a wrap-up podcast for the week. But you're going to see England, England, Iran. Yes. 
Senegal, Netherlands, USA, Wales on that Monday. Argentina, Saudi Arabia, Denmark, Tunisia, Mexico, Poland, and France and Australia on that Tuesday. Morocco, Croatia, Germany, Japan, Spain, Costa Rica, and Belgium, Canada on that Wednesday. And that is probably where we will try to drop another episode to update how the games have going been going so far and to continue the group stage conversation. But, I mean, a lot of good games to kick off this World Cup. Mm-hmm. USA Wales, definitely probably the standout in terms of closeness of competition. Yeah. But I'm excited. I can't wait. Oh, I feel like Mexico Poland is also going to be a very good like yeah, it could be. test for both of those teams. T minus five days. Oh, can't wait. Thank you for listening. Um, if we got anything wrong or if you have your own thoughts on the group stage, uh, comment below. Yeah, let us know what you think about this World Cup. Let yeah. us know how you think the group stage is going to go. We have a long international break from the Premier League. I think games resume on Boxing Day or December 26th. So the next few weeks is going to be full send World Cup mode. So and like, I can't wait. Like, comment, subscribe, do the YouTube things. As Christiane said, let's be involved in this conversation. So comment what you think is going to end up your favorite team, your favorite player. Well, thank you, everybody. And bye. Enjoy some World Cup soccer. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Oh, we should have ended with a Vuvuzela. <laughs> there we go. Bye, everybody. Bye.